Hello. Uh, the folks on Zoom have no audio. We have audio. I hear someone say something. Yeah, I'm also remote. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to let the people out at the uh, the Pfeiffer Center now. <laughs> oh, looks like Frank's working on it. Yeah, we can hear each other, but we can't hear the meeting. I was just going through my audio settings. I didn't <laughs> to make sure I'm using computer audio. So just real briefly, uh, I'll start with myself. I was licensed in 1963 when my mom paid the $25 to take me to the uh, Franklin Institute uh, licensing course. I was WN2MNF and WB2MNF. And then I passed the 13 word admitted code, which at that point was the difference between the technician and the general. Uh, and did my advanced and, and, and stopped there because I, I don't know anything more technical than the uh, screen grid voltage on a 6146 transmitting tube, which I understand is no longer on the, uh, any of the exams. Um, and I'm more of an experimenter than a, a, uh, an operator, although I run the satellite station. So if you're uh, down at the clubhouse, once we get the, uh, that room built up, uh, I'll be glad to show you that room, um, but more, I'm more into uh, SDR radios and Raspberry Pi things and stuff like that. So if that's your interest, um, you know, I'm a guy you might want to talk to. I was very pleased when Ron Block, NR2B, agreed to be the, uh, the vice president. Ron, put your hand up, you know, just so everybody knows, knows who you are. Um, Ron is retired as a professional in the uh, computer and electronics industry, but uh, for the last part of his career, he was he had a, a company that uh, protected uh, electronic equipment from lightning strikes, which is kind of of interest to ham radio operators too. And he's, he's a nationally known expert on that. He's written books on it. He wrote the QSC article on it. He designed the whole uh, grounding system in the clubhouse um, and uh, as you know just so if, if that's an area that you're interested in um ron would be a good guy to uh, talk to what i'm saying you could talk to our uh our, our resource people and what i'm talking about is like at club meetings and and uh, nets and events and stuff it doesn't mean you can call them on their cell phone in the middle of the week okay nobody's on duty at that point but uh good reason to come to a meeting is to talk to uh to, to some of these guys uh, two officers have uh, roles that nobody else wants. One is uh, Al Arison, who is uh, KP2IYU, who is the treasurer. Uh, Al does everything that doesn't happen on the ground. Um, Al uh, puts, the puts the towers up, fixes the towers, puts the antennas up, builds the antennas. Al has built things from the 40 meter beam that is about as big as this room down to the 42 element 70 centimeter satellite antenna that had to be measured with a, with a vernier. So nothing happens at the rub of the clubhouse dealing with RF that Al isn't involved in. So, so that's his area of, uh, of expertise. Uh, Carl Frank W2KBF is the recording secretary if you've read uh, Carl's minutes, uh, you would believe that the uh, club meetings and the directors meetings are absolutely clear, follow a prescribed method, and are uh, very easy to record. Uh, that's because Carl has uh, found a way to um, uh, this one. This one is plugged in, and it is plugged in. Strip on, strip got to be on, doesn't it? How about that? There you go, there you go. Well, it's it's it was a problem that occurred after I uh, I, I went away from. It. Anyway, I was talking about if 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 you think that the the minutes are 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 clear because the meetings are clear, that's because Carl's found a way to uh, subvert the second law of thermodynamics and and create uh, order out of chaos. Um, but Carl's also a uh, very uh, active in emergency communications, uh, particularly digital communications. Uh, that's his thing. Uh, he's also a past president of uh, Radio Club up in North Jersey. So he's bringing us a lot of uh, expertise from there. Uh, joining us on the, uh, uh, the officer group, the executive board, is uh, Frank Romeo, N3PUU, sitting right here. Who, put your hand up, Frank. 
case anybody can't see you. Frank's probably got the broadest level of knowledge in terms of practical stuff of anybody that I know. Uh, Frank's the guy who implemented the grounding system at the clubhouse and rebuilt most of the rooms in the clubhouse. Uh, he designed and built the HF long wire for the Windlink station. He 3D printed and designed the uh, relay controller for the satellite relays, and he installed the toilet in the clubhouse. So if, if that's not a broad area of technical expertise, I don't know what is. Frank's also one of the guys who's at the clubhouse pretty much every Saturday, and uh, so he's a good guy to, uh, to come hit up for an idea. And if I don't know how to uh, go after an idea, Frank's the, uh, the guy that I would talk to. Uh, two new guys are joining us on the board uh, with very different backgrounds, interestingly enough. Uh, Jim Wright, N2GXJ, who I think everybody knows, has been a member for, for probably decades. Uh, past president for three years, uh, was the uh, trustee for several years. Jim kind of works everything. He's, he's an HF guy, but he's also uh, written, uh, he's also, uh, I've, I've seen him posting things about satellites and, and the space station and, and, and things like that. Uh, and he's also one of the great communicators in the club. Whenever he does a presentation, it's always excellent. His articles are really good. You need to, uh, uh, and he's going to be presenting next month. So you need to be here and, and see Jim uh, present. Uh, the other guy who's joining the club for the first time is Chris Pioli, 82CS, sitting here. Chris, is, uh, Chris has only been licensed for like less than two years, but he came out of nowhere and started uh, teaching the, the licensing courses. And we've gotten about 30% of our members from those courses. So it's been incredibly important strategically. Uh, Chris also donated the uh, test bench down at the, uh, the clubhouse in the HF room and is there every Saturday helping somebody out with something. Chris, can, can your programming is HT, you're fixing his equipment or stuff like that. Chris is probably the most helpful guy in the club in terms of helping other people. So he's a very important guy to, uh, to know. Uh, coming back to the, uh, uh, the board, uh, uh, existing members are uh, uh, Chuck Calabrese, WA2TML. Um, and uh, Jim Clark is not here, KA2OSV. Uh, Jim is usually here, but both of these guys generally are at every meeting. They're at every board meeting. They're uh, heavily involved in field day running, field day stations. They're involved in the ham fest. Uh, they've been members of the club for decades. They bring long uh, years of institutional experience and uh, are really, uh, really uh, help out and, and are, are useful in that area. Sitting all the way in the back is uh, Jeff Garth, uh, DBB2ZBN. If Al is the outside guy, Jeff is the inside guy. So Jeff is the guy who does uh, crosstalk. Jeff does the website. Uh, if you come out on Tech Saturday and the door is open and the heat is on and the coffee is on and the cookies are there, that's because Jeff got there at 7.30 and, and, and set it all up for you. So. Um, that's uh, Jeff, and he's been doing that for, for a, a long time. Uh, the last of the board members is Bill Price, NJ2S. Uh, Bill's not here. Bill was, was very involved in the clubhouse rebuild, as I understand. Uh, I wasn't there for that. Uh, then the trustees, or John O'Connell is joining the trustees, taking Jim Wright's place when he moved to the board. Uh, John is at the Computer Electronics Show tonight. He might be, he's on Zoom. Hi, John. <laughs> what did you bring us? So. Um, <laughs> But he starts tomorrow board meeting. Uh, John's in charge of all the uh, computer and networking stuff down at the clubhouse. And uh, one of the guys did a port scan at one point when we had the skunk work stuff up, there were like 35 different devices on the on the network down at the clubhouse. So there are VLANs down there. There's a NAS server down there. Uh, they've just rebuilt the whole uh, networking cabinet, which I'll show you pictures of in a couple of minutes. So, so John's the guy who takes care of, uh, of all of that. Um, Mark Gottlieb is also a trustee. Mark is here tonight. Uh, Mark was, was heavily involved in the uh, clubhouse rebuilding, uh, I know, several years ago. And uh, Bob Fields and Chuck Lanner, the, the other two trustees, uh, and I don't think uh, either of those guys are here tonight. So that's basically the, uh, the leadership group of the club. I wanted to introduce them. If, if you, know, you haven't met somebody, please go introduce yourself. And, and we really do want to get some feedback from uh, from our members. So if you have ideas, uh, things that you, you want us to be doing, things that uh, you'd like us to be doing better, um, please grab one of these guys, myself or anybody else, and, uh, and let them know. So there we go. 
So I wanted to go through just all of the stuff we do in the club just once at the beginning of the year. So everybody's kind of got the, uh, the, the lay of the land of, of what we, uh, we do. There's a lot of new members here and you may not know everything that's, that's part of the, uh, uh, the menu of, of, uh, of our club. So the Wednesday night meetings, obviously you know about them because you're here. Um, there's a program every Wednesday night. Ron is in charge of the programs. Uh, we do have them planned uh, out for the next few months, as I'll show you. There is going to be a session every Wednesday night, and these are planned to be the higher level sessions that are of interest to, uh, uh, to, to pretty much everybody. It doesn't get very technical. This is basically something that's, that's, that has broad interest. And it's one of three different types of sessions that I'm going to talk about that we have. Uh, the second one is Tech Saturday. That's held on the first Saturday after the meeting. So it's either the first or the, or the second Saturday of the month. And it is this coming Saturday. And those sessions are we're sitting at the table at the clubhouse. Uh, Somebody uh, has prepared some type of a presentation on something. We've done it on nano VNA. We've done it on 3D printing. Chris is doing one on uh, on Saturday on uh, the oscilloscopes and uh, troubleshooting with the oscilloscope. So it's something where we can sit around, we can talk to each other, we can show stuff and we can kind of do stuff together. So it's kind of like a lab session. Uh, sometimes it follows what's on Wednesday night and sometimes it doesn't uh, depending on the, uh, uh, on the topic. And Tech Saturday is the first Saturday, but there's somebody at the clubhouse almost every Saturday. Um, you know, if you want to come down, you want to use the HF station, you want to meet somebody, you want to hang out, you want to find out what's going on, you're pretty safe just coming down there around 10 o'clock, between 10 and noon or lunchtime or, or something like that. And there's going to be somebody there. Okay, So feel free to do that. It's, it's, it's a part of a club benefit. Uh, the third... Um, educational session as it as it were is the uh monday night uh alternate monday nights first and third monday actually there's there's three monday there's five mondays this month so there might be a, a, a third one this month but it used to be called the digi net we rebranded it as a technical net to let us talk about uh a broader area of uh, of, of subjects and so the idea here is this is a zoom meeting so everybody's at home so this is something where we can talk about a topic where, you know, we can talk about something and then you're sitting in front of your computer and maybe you're sitting in front of your radio and okay, now, you know, Chris, see if you can do this. Now, Frank, see if you can do this. Oh, Al's, you know, John's having trouble with something, bring it up on your screen and we'll all look at it and then we'll fix it. So, so it, it's kind of a, a different flavor from Tech Saturday, but it lets you be home working with your gear. And, and so we're trying to, uh, uh, come up with a whole bunch of sessions for them. And I'll show you some topics we're talking about uh, a little bit later. Um, we have a, a YouTube site, which Chris is going to talk about in a few minutes, where we're recording all of these different, uh, uh, different sessions. The, each of the three things that I just talked about before, they're going up on YouTube. So if you want to, you can come back and watch them later. We're hoping we'll get some viewership from you know, other people that are, that are distant. Maybe we'll get some club members from, from outside the area out of it. Um, the HF station is, we've got a beautiful HF station, guys. And uh, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, I took my uh, uh, Flex 3000, which I wasn't using, and we stuck it down there. So there's now a Flex radio down at the HF station, down at the clubhouse, and I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, later. 7300 is still there. Uh, the remote access is still there, um, you know, but uh, I please come down, feel free to use the station as long as you're licensed for it, use a remote station. Um, the VHF station, as, as I think most of you know, is, is in process. We've got all brand new hardware, um, courtesy of a grant we got from the ARDC. Uh, the uh, 6400 uh, is here, the transverters are here, um, and it's gonna be operational for the VHF contest, I think, as we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Uh, satellite station will be back as soon as we rebuild the uh, finished rebuilding the VHF room. If, if you didn't see the satellite station, we've got the top of the line satellite antennas. We're using SDR receivers and a transmitter, and we can we can operate satellites as well as as, as anybody and pretty much anybody in the world can. So when that room is back up, we'll have the satellite station operational again. Uh, the electronics test bench at the clubhouse, Chris put together a whole collection of, of all sorts of, of RF and electrical uh, uh, equipment. 
that's that's sitting down there ready for anyone to use it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, come down and look at it. If you don't have a great test bench at home, bring your stuff down to figure out what's wrong with it or to build it or to troubleshoot it. Uh, that's what that uh, what that's what that's there for. Field day, of course, we'll be talking about that in a couple of months. Uh, a, a great event, uh, lots of participation for you guys that are newly new generals or, or new extras. Um, this is a great opportunity to get involved. There's, there's a couple of guys who, who came out last year who really hadn't been involved in anything. They came out and operated all day and all night and really got a chance to see what, uh, what HF operating is like. So if you've got any interest at all, let one of us know and, and we'll get you tuned into the field day uh, group and, and maybe you can, uh, you know, run a, a, you know, one of the stations down there. It's it, by no means an exclusive group group. We're not a, you know, a crazy points chasing group. We're interested in, in doing well, but we're not, you know, um, we're, we're not uh, a military type organization like some of the other groups are. Uh, the ham fest is always a great event uh, that's in September we're, we've already talking about expanding out some stuff sticking a satellite station there. Uh, one of the hospital groups that we talked to is uh, is possibly going to bring out some emergency communications gear that they use, so we may be able to do some more stuff that uh, uh, we haven't done before. Uh, fox hunts uh, Jim Wright, uh, one of the things that he does is is run fox hunts Jim how often are they. About quarterly okay. They're announced. Uh, you're basically uh, looking for a, a little tiny transmitter that's about as, as, as this size, and it can be anywhere from, I guess, up on a parking garage to seven feet underground or something like that. Um, and uh, Jim has done, and we will conscript him to do again a, a really nice overview of how to do fox hunting sometime this summer. Uh, if you haven't done that before, look for it. Um, and that's pretty much the. Uh, uh, the gist of, uh, of what we're doing. So this is this is kind of what the club is. Um, take a look, see what makes sense to you, and and you know, be part of it. Jim, yeah, please. I mean, you filled the screen with you know top to bottom with stuff, and this just scratches the surface. I mean, think of all the nets that we do every week on Tuesday at lunchtime and Thursday in the evenings, and 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 on ten meters. Uh, also on Tuesdays. And then there's the uh, the VEC. I see Gary over in the corner over here. I mean, there's just so many different things that we're involved in the areas and races nets on Sundays. Yeah, yeah. And I have uh, slides on a couple of them, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. What am I doing next? Oh, um, member dues. So dues are due in January. And I think you have uh, may have already seen announcements on this. Uh, that everybody's dues are due in January, unless you're a life member or unless you're a new member who paid after October, in which case your dues carry over to the, the next year. And our club's dues are $30, which is not really high uh, at, compared to, to some other clubs, um, but that's okay because we want everybody to be able to be a member of our club. But there are clubs that uh, where the dues are greater. And I can tell you that in the budget meeting that uh, Alan and some of the rest of us were in last week, at the $30 dues limit, we can keep the lights on in the clubhouse. We can get the grass mowed. We can get the propane filled. We can pay the insurance, but we can't do an awful lot else. And if we had additional funding, um, we could replace the gutters, which need to be replaced as of, uh, especially since we've had the roof done, we could perhaps get a new, replace the air conditioner in the HF room with a, with a more efficient uh, air conditioner. Um, you know, we might be able to, to put a, a, another radio in the, uh, uh, in the HF room. So um, there's an Allen option on the PayPal list that if you'd like to kick in a little bit more, that's fine. You know, uh, other clubs have higher dues. And so people are willing to do that if they're asked, so we're asking. If that works for you and you wanna pick a different amount when you renew, that would be great. If not, that's great too. So that's the way PayPal works. The other thing is that PayPal is great for people who can't come to club meetings, okay? But if, if you use PayPal, a buck and a half of your dues go to pay to PayPal. Now with 200 members, that's a fair amount of money. So if you're coming to a meeting like, you know, tonight or maybe next February, February's meeting would be a great time. Or if you come into Tech Saturday and you want to bring cash or you want to bring a check and you can give them the owl, uh, you'll save us a buck and a half each time. 
So that would be a really nice thing. I just wanted to point that out um, as, as an option that would save us some money. Um, next February meeting would be a great time. If you can remember, remind yourself on January 29th, write a check, bring it to the meeting. And that would be, uh, that would be uh, great for us. Okay. Uh, January events. These are things that are happening in January. And they pretty much happen every month. Um, last Monday was a DigiNet. Okay, and it was uh, it was on FT8. Steve ran it. It was great. Uh, they happen every uh, the first and third Monday of the month. Uh, tonight uh, and then Tech Saturday is uh, the Saturday is Tech Saturday. Chris is going to be doing a uh, a session on uh, troubleshooting with an oscilloscope. So we'll be down at the clubhouse at nine o'clock on Tech Saturday to uh, to have that session. Uh, also, the Riddy contest starts at two o'clock, and we'll have the HF station running with a flex and uh, FL Digi running Riddy. So if you want to come down and work the Riddy contest for a little while, maybe somebody will be operating Riddy. I haven't found anybody operating Riddy yet, but uh, maybe for the contest, they'll be up. And then next Wednesday night is the director's meeting. And I have that highlighted in red because the director's meeting is usually the third Wednesday night, but it's going to be next week because I'm going to be away on the Thursday night, uh, on, on, on the, the, uh, the third Wednesday and, and the board has graciously agreed to move it up. Uh, that's at the clubhouse. Um, and if anyone's, you know, welcome to attend that, if you want to come and see what the director's meeting is seven o'clock uh, next, uh, next Wednesday night at the clubhouse. Um, and then Monday, the 16th is another tech net. Uh, Saturday, the 21st is a VHF contest. Um, and Wednesday, the 25th is the dinner at the clubhouse uh, event. We just had a bunch of us on the fourth Wednesday of the month uh, coming down and, and getting dinner at the clubhouse. We'll go over to Mario's and get, get some kind of food. There's no, no program, no agenda, no work. We're just shooting the breeze about ham radio. So if you want to get out of your house on a Wednesday night and come down and, uh, um, and just, you know, talk to your ham radio buddies, uh, that's, that's what that event is. So um, general membership programs, Ron, you want to talk about uh, what's coming up? Coming up, uh, actually tonight, you know, we weren't going to let him go away completely. So uh, we twisted his arm. And uh, so Tony is going to uh, talk tonight on uh, five band DXCC. Okay. Next month, uh, we're going to go into a remote flex operation with uh, Jim Wright, who spoke to us just a few minutes ago, and uh, Sheldon Parker, who unfortunately is my usual riding partner. Uh, but uh, he can't be here tonight, but he guarantees me he'll be here next week because I'm not going to take his place. Okay. And then in March, uh, we have the uh, Rowan folks who have come to us and uh, asked for some help uh, on uh, communications uh, with a rocket that they uh, are building and are going to put into competition. So uh, they, they have a slideshow that shows the genesis of the whole process and uh, just how that whole thing is going to work. And then uh, in April, uh, Dr. Bob uh, Heil is going to talk to us, and I'm not quite sure about the topic yet. Uh, I've tried to twist his arm and push him into the New Ham uh, area, and uh, he hasn't quite grasped onto it and said, yeah, I know exactly what you want. So I got to work on that one a little bit. But guaranteed, we're going to have something about sound, microphones and things like that. You know how that works. So I'm sorry. Phasing. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay. See, some of you have uh, already heard him speak a couple of times, I'm sure. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I missed that meeting. So, all right. And then in uh, May, uh, we're going to talk, have uh, Randy Smith, who uh, is out for, actually out from the uh, Illinois area, going to talk to us about uh, Arden. So that's where we are right now. I'm working on a couple of others. Uh, some club members and whatnot. So uh, we should have some decent programs. I'm open for feedback. Anybody wants a specific program, would like to give a program, I will be around later to twist arms. Just let me know. Okay, thanks, Ron. Okay, so 
Now into the uh, actual club business. I think I probably skipped a couple of points if I can. New members um, and minutes of the meeting, yes. So uh, are there any new members uh, or visitors with us here tonight? Yes, um, Harry Maloney, KE2ALG. Bill Lapp, KD2YNN. Okay. Good evening. This is Bob Familio, K3 Romeo Foxtrot, the AWRL Vice Director for the Atlantic Division. Pleasure to be here. Oh, Bob Familio, the AWRL Vice Director. Yeah. Bob, thanks for coming. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, Tom Abernathy, our director, uh, asked me to send his regrets. We only had a couple of days notice and he's got a prior engagement tonight, but I'm glad I was able to sneak, sneak home here in time to, to make your meeting. I've had the pleasure of coming out and seeing you folks during the ham fest and that you have every summer. And um, I won't be able to stay the whole night, but I'll stay for your business meeting. I am interested in, in hearing more. Okay, hey, Bob, thanks. Thanks so much for, uh, for coming. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice to have uh, someone from ARRL at, uh, at our meeting. Uh, there was another new member. Chris, did you catch? Uh, okay. Okay. Welcome, Harry. Is there everyone else on Zoom? Uh, Bill Lapp, KD2YNN. Hi, Bill. How Thanks you doing? For joining us this evening? Yes. Okay. First time. Okay. okay. And yourself? I am Dave Kapler. My call sign is N3DRK. Uh, and I talk really fast. So everybody, my call sign is N3DRK, N3DRK. So, uh, I was licensed three years ago, almost exactly to the day. Uh, uh, funny, funny how I got into ham radio. I, I've, uh, Talked on radios all my life, aircraft radios, marine radios, and police radios for 32 years. So um, I have to do that, the, the background in the operation of radios, not how they work. I don't know anything about the guts. I just know all the buttons and knobs on the outside. Um, I, uh, was, uh, I retired 12 years ago, and now I'm in TV production. So uh, that's, that's my second career. But I was talking to a colleague, and I said, how many government licenses do you have? And I counted up nine. For, for all different kinds of stuff. And I said, I ought to get a ham license now that they don't have the, uh, the CW requirement anymore, which I guess a lot of people are in that boat. So that's how I ended up uh, three years ago. Um, I, uh, I was in, I was in uh, Florida for Christmas with my family. And as I was driving home, I listened to tutorials and, and took the test the next day and got, uh, got my license on the tech. So a year later, I got general and uh, I'm enrolled in the uh, uh, extra class coming up, so. And not either, yeah, <laughs> so um, that's that's well, now I can go into detail. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm really eager to become an active member in the club. I, uh, I heard a lot of good things about this club and, and uh, I'm anxious to participate. So thank you all. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brand new. Brand new. I am uh, Ben Johnson, uh, WB2G UK. I've been licensed for pretty much 60 years as of April. It's amateur extra. Uh, I'm a CW guy. I've only operated CW for 60 years. And uh, I was QRT for 36 years and got back into the game back in uh, 2020, just after hearing some guys on YouTube and got interested. And interestingly enough, I came to field day in 21 and got a mind mill worth of information from your club. Just the two hours I spent at field day, and especially Jim Wright, things I had not seen and would needed to get into. It's a big difference in 36 years of being absent, but I'm looking forward to being a part of this club. You guys got a good technical club. I've watched you for a couple of years. You've got a great reputation. So I'm looking forward to being a part of your club. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to say that we have two guys here who are new members uh, Ben Johnson, who is a ham for many, many years, and Dave, who is a recent ham by comparison, 
but Dave makes decisions very quickly. Steve, uh, W2SC, W2SCF and I were on the air one day chatting, and uh, Dave kicked in from somewhere on the highway. He was driving back from Trenton, and we talked a little bit about the club on the air that day, and that night he signed up. He makes his decisions quickly. So, you know, Dave, Dave joined very quickly, and it was a very quick decision as compared to Ben, who watched us for two years and then decided to join. Either way, it's all good. Well, let's let's Frank. It was Frank's idea. We'll kick it around, John. John had asked if we could move the uh, uh, for you guys on Zoom. John had asked if we could move the uh, uh, dinner to a different night so it doesn't conflict with the uh, um, SGRA meeting. Um, can we have a motion to approve the minutes, Carl's excellent minutes? All right, second. All in favor? That's pretty easy. Uh, we got a head count. Okay, yeah, treasurer's report. All right. Uh, well, we uh, have our budget. Uh, we had the budget committee get together and put together a, uh, our budget that we're going to uh, show to the directors. And then next month, it will be sh uh, shown to the membership for approval. Um, so we're starting from zero, of course, at the beginning of the year here. So we do have. Uh, just for the past four days, uh, we do have a total income of $824, which is all dues, and uh, expenses of $340 for a overall uh, net of plus $488. And uh, Money in all accounts is 46,213. And again, that includes the $25,000 grant for the VHF uh, tower and antennas. And also roughly 4,000 is left for the rebuilding uh, campaign, which will be going to the VHF uh, station since the HF station is now complete. That's uh, all for treasurers. I get a motion to approve the report. Second. All in favor? Thank you. So I have I have some slides for Clubhouse, but um... Um, I'll just do a brief. Yeah. All right. I'm the. Um, I'm the uh, clubhouse chairman, so I uh, the clubhouse is in pretty good shape. Um, the HF uh, station is uh, in good shape. Uh, we have a four-position switch now. To switch between the 7300 ICOM IC 7300, the Flex 3000, the remote, um, the remote station, or if you want to bring your own rig, that's we have the fourth position. We don't have a lot of room on the desk right now as far as bringing your own rig. We're it's mainly because we're the, the VHF room is still uh, being uh, rebuilt, and we have a printer back there that's taking up quite a bit of room so um vhf rooms coming along nicely the um all the tough uh, very tough work is done the uh, electrical networking insulation paneling ceiling all mostly done by frank and 3 puu um Oh, and the uh, ground, the ground bus, the main ground bus is is installed. Uh, the six inch wide copper strap is uh, goes around the circumference of the room. Uh, we will be doing the VHF contest uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. 
looking for people who want to maybe get their feet wet in contesting. We're gonna have some temporary antennas. Uh, we, I managed to put a six meter beam up on the uh, damaged VHF tower. And I, I'm going to put uh, antennas up on the tower trailer. Uh, we have the tower trailer is out, uh, is already out there. It's already uh, sighted. And now uh, we are in the process of repairing the partially damaged VHF antennas that, that were on the VHF tower. Should uh, hope to have them done uh, in the next couple of weeks. So we'll be on the lower four bands, 6, 2, 222, and 432. And that's about it for now. Catch up. There we go. I've got some pictures. So I mentioned that the uh, we had uh, received the Flex 6400 for the VHF room. That is here. Uh, that was, again, a grant from ARDC, part of the grant from ARDC. Uh, and we'll be using that for the, uh, the VHF contest. Uh, here are the antennas that Al was just talking about. You can see the uh, six meter beam. Let's see it here too, Al, if you want. Um, that's mounted on top of the, 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 the VHF tower that's still folded over. So he, he mounted that on the side of it. And then right next to it, you can see uh, Al's tower trailer mounted, which is where the other uh, antennas are, uh, are going to go. Uh, the networking cabinet, um, as, uh, as Al mentioned, uh, has also been installed. My, my screen is blocking some of that, so I got to look at this. So this is basically the networking cabinet in the VHF room. You can see the grounding strips going up along the side of it. I'm going to show this with a laser. I can make the laser work. Yeah, you see, you can see the, the, how the grounding is connected up into the cabinets. So the cabinet is all grounded. Then up here is the uh, patch panel. We've got 40 uh, cat cables coming into here and that are running into the cabinet. And this is an older picture. I have a newer picture that uh, shows some more work done. And then down here is where the UPS is mounted. So that's hanging there uh, along the side. And then... This is more of what it looks like now. So this has got the cables now coming from the patch panel running down into the back of the cabinet. These are now connected up to the switch. Again, this is an older picture. And then this is the uh, fiber optic cable that runs from the HF room, as I've mentioned in the past. Um, we didn't want to run Cat5 cable because if there was a lightning hit, there could be inductance from that. So we had to have non-conductive cable running. So this is all fiber cable that's running, I think, from the closet and from the, uh, from the HF room uh, into the uh, networking cabinet. And then this is the way the grounding works. So this is basically the, uh, the electrical uh, from the electric mains okay, from, the, from the, the, the circuit panel coming here, going into this protector. And you can see how these cables have been shortened here per Ron's suggestion, again, to avoid inductance. And then here's where the UPS is plugged in again with a shortened cable. And then the uh, networking cables are, uh, are plugged in there. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, as, as it, if you open the door, it would close, it would cover that. So yeah, to be able to open the cabinet, you got to be able you you got to be able to. Uh, um, it's fed by the uh, from the uh, uh, circuit breaker panel. You're talking about RF, or are you talking about AC? Let me go back. So you're talking about where where this comes from. Okay, that's coming from the circuit breaker panel, which has been installed in the VHF room right above the light switch. So the VHF room now has its own breaker panel. Frank, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this stuff. Yeah, you're right. Uh, as the project So, so right now, if that's connected to a breaker over in the uh, middle, now if we put in a plug panel to 
Yeah, so just, just to summarize for you on Zoom, um, the power going to that outlet uh, comes uh, from a uh, circuit breaker panel that is inside the VHF room that was installed uh, recently. It's, it's right over the light switch, and that is connected into the main uh, circuit breaker panel that's, uh, that's outside in the, uh, in the main room. And then uh, this is what the, uh, the uh, networking cabinet looks like right now you can see it the, the the back and the front of it so if you look at the back you can see there's a bunch of networking switches over here this is the back of the network uh, uh the nas server this is the back of the uh comcast router this is on on the the front of the cabinet uh this is the nas server here this is the comcast uh router this is a bunch of switches and they're all connected uh, basically back up through this uh patch panel here so as i said we've got a very complicated network uh, down there and this is just the vhf room okay this is just the vhf room uh i think the server is uh for now going to go down below here like right next to where the ups is frank am i correct on that okay frank says i'm right do we have something better yeah we're, we're still looking at what what the best option for the server is we've got a couple of, of servers now but they're all uh, real kick-ass servers, and they pull a lot of power, and we'd like something that pulls a little bit, uh, a little bit less. Okay. Um, this uh, I don't know whether we announced this last time, but this is the uh, the Elecraft amplifier that uh, that John Hill has uh, now uh, uh, moved from being a loan to a uh, donation to the club, and you can see this uh, small plaque on the top of it that now says this. Uh, so, John, we wanted to recognize the. Uh, yeah, you'll have to go to the, you can't see that through the remote station. Well, we got two, John. One is gold and one is black. So you can come down to the clubhouse and decide which one goes on which. Right. And, and there's, we can get one for your forehead too, if you want, um, probably. So, but I, uh, we, I did want to want to make sure that everyone was aware of, uh, of that. Um, uh, trying to move a little more quickly because we're already at quarter after and we're still in the business meeting. Um, we got a flex running in the HF room. And so this is what the screen looks like on a flex 3000. It's really interesting because the, the guy who wrote power SDR has advanced it considerably since the flex became an outmoded and older uh, radio. So uh, power SDR can do a lot more stuff than, than, than originally a, a flex could. So that's sitting in there and we're, we're working with it. We also put PST rotator in there. Um, which uh, is a really nice program for running the rotator. So for example, you can put a grid square in here and it'll lame it, or you can put a call in here and it'll lame it. Uh, this is interesting because you know it has the capability to go to a local weather station, measure the wind direction and aim the antennas into the wind if you wanted to do that. And so I put that up, not that we're gonna use it, but just you know because I thought it was kind of cool. But you can also see that on uh, whatever date this was, it was 23 degrees outside. So it was probably before Christmas. Um, the other interesting thing about PST rotator is that you guys who work FT8 know that if you uh, want to work someone, you just click on them right over here, right? And that initiates the contact and FT8 does everything else. Well, PST rotator will go pick up the uh, location of them and it will aim the antenna for them too. So now you have to do even less if it's possible to get an FT8 Q cell. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, it, I don't know if it's possible. Uh, Jim mentioned the nets. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, Jim Clark is not here, so I don't know whether we have uh, counts of people on the nets, but here are the nets. As Jim mentioned, the Tuesday noon net, 10 meter net, right to net Thursday night, Skywarn and the Aries net. Uh, and most of them are on the repeater or uh, the one is on 10 meters. Um, Steve, go ahead.
I'm going to bring you the mic. Uh, for the Tuesday noon net, uh, for last month, we had 65 total participants for an average of 13. And for the Thursday night net, we had a total of 55 for an average of 11 for the, for the month. And for the year, for the Tuesday, we had an average of 10.9 participants. And the Thursday night net, we had 10.8 average. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Contests. Tony, any, uh, any contests other than what we've got here? Uh, the two good ones. Uh, my, my favorite contest, the North American CUSO party. Um, I think the 14th of January, which is Saturday, is the CW, and I believe the phone is a week later. These are 12 hours long. They start about one o'clock in the afternoon, local time. It's all North America. It's all low power. They do allow you to use spotting now in the past. It wasn't permitted for single ops, but now it's permitted and uh, you're allowed to operate 10 hours. So uh, get on there and have a great time. It's a friendly contest and it's a lot of fun. And before you know it, just as you're getting into the groove, it's over. And, uh, the uh, last weekend of the month is the CQ 160 CW. So that's the big ones that are coming up. That's the only one you can't operate from the clubhouse because we don't have a 160 meter antenna. Uh, repeater committee, anything on the repeater? We got to do some work on the repeater. That's, that's, that's the repeater committee. Education, Chris. Okay, uh, as everybody or most people are aware, we're getting ready to start up the next session of tech prep, uh, I'm sorry, test prep classes. That'll be starting uh, the week of February 13th with technicians on Monday, generals on Tuesday, and extras on Friday. Uh, I am always interested in people who are interested in teaching, helping to teach. People with amateur extra licenses who are interested in helping to teach reach out to me and let me know if you're interested. I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do to get you involved in it. Um, the um, invitations to those who have attended past classes and are interested in upgrades, I'll be put, putting those out starting the end of next week, about a month before the, cl the classes start, I'll start getting invitations out and, and gathering up people. But I already have a couple people from this room who are in involved. Uh, Dave is one of them. Dave has signed up for the extra class. Um, there's a couple of people in here who, who are interested, who are involved. So um, that, that's upcoming. TechNets, the current class that we're running, as everybody has been talking about, is the um, FT8 uh, and its related modes and, and um, features, FT8, FT4, uh, JS8 call, things like that, and all the other things that you need to do to go along with it, such as um, Grid Tracker, uh, Logbook of the World, um, PSK reporter, the other the other tools that you need to, to be effective with FT8. Steve's doing a yeoman job, yeoman's job of handling that right now. He's scheduled to, to have the rest of January and all of February available if he needs that many sessions. And if we need more time, we can squeeze an extra week in, in, in January because there are five Mondays. So I'm going to play that by ear with Steve. Let him let me know what he needs. Um, let's see what else is on that. Back up one, one second there. Okay, that's it. Uh, oh, YouTube videos. Everything that we do in the TechNet sessions gets recorded. Those videos get processed by John Pierce and put up on our YouTube channel. I just took the one for Monday night. I was just finally able to get that downloaded. Uh, Zoom had a problem with their, with their server. I couldn't download it yesterday. But I did get that downloaded today, and it's in the Dropbox for John to process. So that'll be up on YouTube soon. We have a tremendous amount of viewership on our YouTube channel, and I don't think it's all from the club. We were looking at some stats. Weren't we looking at some, some people coming in from afar on that, John? Yeah, yeah, from upstate. Okay, let's see. What else do we have here? New members. Uh, KD2YNN, Bill, who's on, uh, and ha Harry, uh, KD2, KE2ALG, they're both on Zoom with us tonight. Dave Kepler is here with us. 
And Rich Angelino, Angelino, who joined as an associate member, is not here with us tonight in, in either form, but um, he is a new member. Rich is one of the people who signed up for classes in the, uh, in the February session. He signed up for the technician class. He wants to get his license. Welcome to all those guys. You know, you've joined a good club, guys. Tech Saturday okay. on the... Uh, I'll you got that? Tech, yeah. So this is Tech Saturday. This, is, this was uh, well, about a month ago. Uh, this is just a shot from the uh, session we did on CAD. This is what a typical Tech Saturday looks like. Had about 18 people signed in there. Um, and uh, I did a session on uh, CAD design for 3D printing, and then Frank did one on SketchUp that he's using to design the, uh, the VHF room. And then uh, Carl did one who, who he works with AutoCAD as a professional. And so he did a session on that. So this is, this is you know, what a, what a typical session looks like. And it, it, it works out really well. And then uh, this Saturday, Chris is going to do a session on uh, troubleshooting with an oscilloscope. Um, and uh, the ready contest starts at two. So if you come out on Saturday, you can sit through a session in the morning and then you can go operate uh, ready in the afternoon. I'm not going to go through all of these. We, you, know, you just take a look at the list of possible topics that we were kicking around for Tech Saturday or Tech Net uh, topics, uh, DMR and antenna design software and building a tape measure antenna, you know, uh, video uh sdr software and things like that um this is what we're kicking around um you know, let us know what you think is interesting you know maybe you you, you know take a screenshot of this with your phone or, or, or think about it or go back and look at it and you know see if if, if there's anything that's uh, particularly that that you'd like us to do also we're, we're looking for people who can present on this it shouldn't always be the same guys all the time because none of us really know that much about all this stuff and especially on the monday night nets you don't have to be an expert you're really almost more of a discussion leader than you are a uh, a teacher so if you think you know more than 50 percent of, of the people who would be on the net to talk about psk reporter or building a tape measure antenna put your hand up and, and and come on out and do it you know because it'd be really nice to have a a broader group of uh of, of teachers and, and instructors and guides on some of these things so a lot of this stuff gets pretty technical and i'm sure there's guys out here who know about it and, and all you got to do is put your hand up and you can teach the rest of us about it so um, we finally got new link uh, computer on the WinLink station. Those of you who's working with WinLink, uh, Carl W2KBF has donated this. It's an i5 processor replacing the Atom processor that was there before. We went from four gigs of RAM to 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, this sucker looks like it loafs on running WinLink. It's 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 loafing to the extent that I'm trying hard to resist my uh, my urge to put something else on there because you got so much excess capacity. But I know what a bad idea that is, so we're not going to do it. But uh, WinLink has been working much better since Carl um, thankfully donated that uh, that box. Uh, we, we had a, a session on Meteor Scatter last month. I almost forgot about this. Uh, Frank uh, just sent out a note to a bunch of us and said there's some there's a meteor shower tonight. You want to come down and try and work some Meteor Scatter? which I'd never done. And it, it sounds kind of specious. You're trying to bounce signals off of meteors, but it actually works. So this is a shot of Frank in the HF room. When, this is right after I brought the flex down there. The flex works on six meters. Uh, and of course, we, what are we doing with six meters in the HF room? We loaded it up on the 80, 80 meter dipole. We, we couldn't transmit with it, but it actually worked, received pretty well on the 80 meter dipole. And uh, you're, you're listening to stations transmit and also you're listening for distant stations to come in. So sometimes you can hear the guy who's across the river transmitting, but in this case, and I know you can't see it, maybe the Zoom guys can see it. This is an actual QSO. It was a WA2 station talking to a VE station and the WA2 station we were hearing direct, but the VE station we weren't hearing direct. We did hear that reflected off of meteors. Okay, so that was pretty cool. I'd never done that before. We, that's, that's six meters. And then Frank was in the uh, VHF room working two meters with similar results. We never worked any QSOs, but we did actually hear stuff reflected off of meteors. So there's the next meteor shower. I think there was one a week or so ago, but the next one's in April. And I think we may give that a shot too. So we'll put out an announcement for that. And if you want to come down and, and, and see us try to reflect some signals off of meteors, that's fun. I'm going to skip that one for a second. Um, the 
the Leicester County Amateur Radio Foundation, which is a 501c3. I just mentioned that the flex and the uh, uh, transverters have been received. The amplifiers are still out on order. We're not expecting them to come for another uh, another few months, but uh, but you know, two thirds of the uh, of the station is there. And there was one uh, donation that we got, which came through a, uh, uh, a not-for-profit organization, I believe, called Brevity, which uh, vets um, charitable organizations and I think makes them eligible potentially for, uh, uh, for matching donations. I'm looking for someone to shake their head vertically and, and confirm that that's right. And I'm not seeing, I am seeing that, so that appears to be... Uh, to be correct. So perhaps if your uh, company is uh, matches donations and you'd like to make a contribution to the foundation, which is a C3, you could get a matching donation for it. The constitution, Mr. Black, do you, I'm sorry, Mr. Black, um, do you have anything to uh, say about the constitution? You were at the uh, AmFest. Uh, I, I received an award, and all of a sudden, uh, the my name changed from Ron Block to Bob Black. So, yeah, a minor issue, <laughs> but uh, they reminded me of it. And uh, apparently, there's a YouTube uh, video of it somewhere along the line too. So, okay, a, a quiz right now. How many of you remember what I spoke about last month? I'm impressed. Nine minutes. <laughs> They're very easily approved. Yes, they are. Okay. Last month I spoke about a, a change to the constitution. It was brought up by one of the board members uh, where we really had some incompatible instructions and we required a sponsor's signature and we're allowing folks to apply for membership via electronic media. So that really fell apart very, very quickly. We talked about it briefly last month. Uh, one of the members here brought up some suggested changes. And so that scrapped that. So we're now in the process of uh, trying to get it approved uh, by this membership. And so that requires two presentations. This will be the first. Last month's didn't count. And then uh, we'll go on for uh, voting. So if I could have the next slide, please. No, Chris has them. All right, while, while they're sorting that out, uh, for those here in the room, there's, that's the actual wording of the original constitution or the rephrase, the current constitution. Okay, and it gets uh, rather laborious there, but in the middle of it, uh, it says in red uh, that you must have a signature of a sponsor who's in good standing with the club. Okay, that becomes uh, quite difficult to do in the electronic media. So what we've come up with uh, with some help is the next slide. Uh, that's the one, there we go. Okay, so it now reads as a suggestion, an applicant for membership in the club shall complete a membership application form and submit it with an appropriate dues amount to the club for acceptance. Kind of, kind of straightforward. Membership application shall be acted upon by the board of directors and for approval or disapproval. And then the applicant shall be notified by the board's decision. Okay, they're the new words. Are there any comments to those new words? Yes, sir. It says uh, it's an appropriate dues amount. Well, if they're, if they're not approved, do they get the dues back? Oh, of course they do. That's not in there. Uh, that's true, it's not in there. But we are an ethical organization, believe me. So. I would suggest that uh, we leave it this way. Otherwise we have to start again next month. And I, I'd like to get it done before I retire. That's true. We could always add it to the bylaws. If you would put the last slide up, Chris. Okay. Uh, a couple of you got solicited uh, the beginning of the meeting for a signature that says you will endorse and uh, support this because the Constitution says that we must have 15 signatures. So we have the 15 signatures. Okay. Uh, we have posted a written notification in Crosstalk, and I'm sure you've all read it with great interest, and you recognize all the words that I've shown as being exactly what's there. 
Nobody's saying yes or no. Uh oh. We have to have two uh, consecutive presentations. This is the first. Next month will be the second. And then we'll vote, and we need 75% approval. Okay. Thanks. Hey, this is Mark, uh, WM2Y. I hosted the Fox Hunt. Uh, when was that? December or recently? <laughs> uh, we had it at uh, Tranquility Trails over in Sweetsboro or that area. Okay. And uh, we had a pretty good turnout for that. And uh, I think Frank was the first one to find it. Al got stopped by somebody thinking he was looking for radiation. <laughs> so I had to quickly come right out of the bush to, to go to, to, to help him out there to make sure it's like, no, 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 we're okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, it was pretty fun. It was, it was a good time. It was a little cold, so we didn't get to try any uh, RF shenanigans for that. So that that's about it. And cracking? I, I haven't heard about it. Release the cracking. Somebody's going to release the cracking. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm thinking a third harmonic amplifier. Let's <laughs> try some different things. So anyway. Thanks, Mark. Um, is there any, I hope there's no old business. Is there any old business? No old business. Great. Is there any new business? Yeah, Mark. You want a mic? I got a mic now. All right. I got a mic. You got to help the Zoom guys. Uh, that tripod in the corner is up for grabs. Whoever wants it, take it away. That That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> that's a new tripod. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyone else? I don't know how much uh, Phyllis Martin, she has a couple of towers over there she wants to get rid of. So if anybody's interested uh, to get in touch with her, I don't know about price. I don't have to negotiate that with her. Okay, thanks. And this is Chuck. I have badges here for Carl N two C R W. Okay, motion to adjourn. So, all right. Um, let's take. We're already at uh, twenty five of. Uh, let's take five quick minutes, okay? And then Tony is going to do his session on uh, five band DXCC. He's going to teach me how to work uh, hundred countries on eighty meters, which I have no idea how you do. On a weekend. Oh, 50 50. 50 50 is available now.
All right, I'm going to draw the 50-50. Grab your tickets. Got a big uh, pot here, $120 pot. Well, 60 once it's split. All right. Shake them all up. We have to bring a little tumbler. We have one, a little tumbler. All right, and... Last three numbers, nine, three, zero. Last three numbers, nine, three, zero. Keep it, you sure? Thank you. Mary is uh, giving the money back to the club. Thank you, Mary. I'm sure he would like some stuff like that, but it's good to be well, John. Hey, to car. Okay. Either of us. Okay, can we uh, find our seats, please? Please do that so I don't have to put the uh, microphone in the uh, speaker like I did last time. Um, right. Tracy, Tracy. Okay. Uh, it, has everybody signed in? If you haven't signed in on the sun that sign in sheet, please raise your hand and Jim Wright will bring it around to you. I see a, I'm not sure he was really raising. Are you, were you raising your hand that you didn't sign in? Yes, you did. Anybody else? Everybody else signed in. Okay. Uh, Tony's going to uh, tell us how to work uh, five band TXCC. Um, oh, come on. Okay. A, a microphone. Thicker. A microphone. And... Thank you. Can I sit? Or do you want me to stand? Okay. All right. Um, DXCC. Now, there's people that are avid DXers and they like chase dx for like 30 40 50 years so after being licensed for 40 years about six years ago i decided to start working some dx so naturally i'm not going to be able to do this for 30 or 40 years so i wanted to uh well first of all i started working a lot of countries on 20 and before i knew it i was up to 120 countries on 20 meters so i started getting the idea that I could get five band DXCC if I keep at it. Well, DXCC is a hundred countries confirmed and it could be on any mode, uh, but five band DXCC 
you have to do it on 80 meters, 40 meters, 20, 15, and 10. So it's a total, a total of 500 contacts, which is a lot, 500 countries, and um, they all have to be confirmed. So that means you need a QSL of some sort. So naturally, I didn't want to have to put that much work into it or put 30 years into it. So um, I decided to try and do this in, you know, three, four or five years rather than 30, 40 or 50. So after about five years, uh, I finally just last year, I finally did complete the five band DXCC. So it took me about five years. Um, and it's really easier than you think, uh, because there's a lot of aids and, uh, uh, accessories and things that you can use now, uh, um, you know, that weren't available 30, 40 years ago and the sunspot cycle is ramping up. Uh, so it's just going to get easier. If you start today, it'll just continue to get easier. Let me see if I can learn how to, uh, advance this slide thing. Okay. All right. So the first 100 are easy. If you want to get your DXCC, uh, just mixed band, mixed mode, it's relatively easy to work 100. And you don't have to work anything exotic. You don't have to work anything rare. You know, half of them can be in the Caribbean. The other half can be in Europe. You don't need high power. Um, but if you want to do five band, I really suggest you focus on one band at a time and you start with an easy one. 20 is the best. 20 is the best DX band. And once you have your hundred worked and confirmed on 20, then you can move to 40 or 15 and start the process over again. Um, I thought the toughest one was going to be 80 and I was wrong because we were in the bottom of the sunspot cycle. And so um, it turned out for me, the toughest one and the one that took five years was 10 meters. But if you do it now, that won't be the case. 80 will be the toughest one. And if you're gonna work a hundred countries on 80, you're not gonna do it all on phone. You'll be lucky to get 30 or 40 countries on phone. You need to work all modes that you can work. And that means you might have to do some CW or FT8 uh, and antennas might be tough. You know, a, a low dipole is not a big DX antenna. So you're going to have a challenge with 80. So I say, start with the bands that have good propagation. Now, if 15 is great now do 15. Um, I eventually when, uh, last year, when, uh, 10 meters got going good, I eventually worked, uh, a hundred easily on 10, but it just, it took years to do because 10 was so dead for so long. Let me see if I, okay. All right. So as I said, the, uh, the prime bands are 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. You can get other bands. Once you complete the basic certificate, you can add 30 meters. You can add 17. You can add 160 if you could do it. Um, but mixed mode is the basic award. And if you want a, a challenge, you can do it all on CW. Um, if you want less of a challenge, you can do it all on FT8 or FT4. Phone is a tough one. And let me tell you why phone is tough. Um, if you're going to use the DX cluster to find DX that's been spotted, the only way to get spots for phone is when people hear or work a station and spot it. Uh, lots of people can be on the air and never get spotted on phone. When you're on CW, you have the reverse beacon network. When you're on FT8, you have PSK reporter. These are automatic spotting uh, modes that are computers that are listening and putting the spots out of where they're hearing the stations. And if you're just gonna stay on the phone, you're gonna rely on spots that are generated by people and to the extreme if you're not going to use the spotting cluster if you're just going to tune around and just work what you hear especially on phone then it's going to take you 20 or 30 years to work five band dxcc so this is all about how to do it 
quickly how to speed up the process and how to use every tool that's at your disposal in the modern 21st century world of HF. Uh, also with the spotting clusters, uh, I highlighted down there, automatic notifications. That's a really cool thing because you can set up your, um, your spotting software to notify you by email um, when something that you're looking for has been spotted. And that's really cool. I didn't do that, but I have the capability to do it. Yes. For the DX country that you're looking for. Yeah. If you need um, Zimbabwe on 40 meters and it gets spotted, you can have your tracking software notify you by email hey, Zimbabwe just got spotted on 40. And then you can run to the shack, you drop what you're doing, run to the shack and get on there. Right, so what you're gonna need, and this is what got me started, interested in, in DXCC, is good logging and tracking software. This is a way to keep track of what you've worked, what you need, and you know that makes it all easy. If you just have piles of QSL cards, it's gonna be very difficult. When you hear a station on the air or see a spot, it's gonna be hard to know whether you have that one or not, especially if you don't have the call sign prefixes memorized, which I, I don't. So you need a good piece of software to keep track of your, of your DX worked and DX needed. Um, I use, uh, DX Lab Suite. DX Lab Suite is a collection of programs, probably between seven and nine programs. You don't have to use them all, but they're all integrated. They all collaborate with each other and they really take all the work out of it. So I'm going to see if I can, if I can uh, share my screen here. Let's see. Share screen. Okay, I want to share this one. Okay. So the first piece of software in the DX Lab suite. Okay. That I'm going to show you. There it is. It's called Spot Collector. Spot Collector can connect to up to seven different spotting nodes or clusters, seven different sources. Right now I'm just using one because of the huge amount of bandwidth that it takes to do that. But it will show you on the screen what's been spotted, what band it's on, what mode it's on. Uh, it's in red. You can sort it by what you need. I don't know if you see my cursor down there. It says need by by DXCC country, by band. Say so you only wanna look at the 40 meter spots. And this is all the incoming spots that you can collect in real time. And it's a huge amount of data, but basically it shows you what's available now and you can make it show you only what you need. And it takes a lot of powerful software to do that. And it's more than I can do myself. I can't look at a thousand spots and know which one of my need, but this one will do it for you in real time. Okay. Let me go uh, minimize that. Let's see if it works. It says my screen, my screen sharing is paused. I better go back to that. So um, the next piece of software, which is probably the most important one. Now, resume share. Sorry for the uh, reading this out loud thing. You're just sharing the application. All right. Stop sharing. Bring up the other application. 
All right, I want to show. I want to show this one. So, um, share screen, and I want to show DX Keeper. All right, DX Keeper is your master log. This is my actual station log right here. It's up to date. Um, this little counter down here, 56,160, that's how many contacts are in my station log. Okay. And the last contact I made was on 12. I haven't been on the air in a little while, but it was a holiday season. Uh, about seven years I've been using this. This is all in the last seven years. In seven years. Yeah. That's a Yes, uh, this is not my station computer. I exported this log into this a couple days ago. This is my field day computer. So yeah, you can export the whole log. I did that just uh, Sunday night. So you can check your progress by clicking the tab that says check progress and it says DXCC in real time. And it's gonna show you by band. Uh, it shows that I have 234 worked. They're not all confirmed, but it'll show you how many you have confirmed. I have the work box checked and you can check phone or CW. If I wanna see how many I have on say 160, I click on band 160 worked and it says I have 59. So obviously I don't have DXCC on, on 160. I have 59 worked, probably about 80% of them confirmed. And then I can go to 20, which is the number one DX band. It's probably over 200, yeah, 215. That's mixed mode. I don't do digital and PSK uh, modes, but they're there if I wanted to. Um, I have 195 on CW. I have a, oh no, hmm. Okay. All right, let me see if I can do that. All right, let me see if I can figure out how to do that. All right, could I do new share? Stop share. Do my whole de desktop, right? All right, where is that at? Share screen. Hmm, well, I don't see it, but I'll show you this little map here. This little map shows, this shows by band, by mode, and you can filter by band and, and by mode, and it keeps them all separately. They'll tell you what you've worked and what you need. And it's integrated into your, into your master log. So that's DX Keeper. Okay, now there's other, there's other features. Commander is the part that interfaces to your radio. Let me see if I can bring that one up. Let's see. There's Commander. Okay. Share screen. Okay, this is Commander. Now, obviously my radio is not here, but if it was, Commander shows you what frequency you're on, VFOA, VFOB, what mode you're on, and it'll record that information in a log. So if you work at the X station on lower sideband on 14.255, uh, it'll take that information right off of Commander and record it right in the log for you. So that's part of the whole suite of programs. And there's also um, DX view, which breaks down into finer detail what you need uh, on what band. So 
It would be easier if I could show the whole desktop. But the important one was DX Keeper because that's what is your station log. Now, I work contests. I use a different logger. And at the end of the contest, I do a um, uh, upload of my contest log into DX Keeper. I use N1MM for a contest log, but um, it's made just for contesting. It's of no value for tracking DX. But what I do is before I upload it, I'll look at um, DX Keeper and see how many countries I have. And then I'll do the upload. Then I'll look at it again and see if it's gone up. And then I'll know if during the contest I picked up any new ones. And in the beginning, I picked up a lot of them. But um, these days, not so much. I'm up over 200 countries now, and it's very rare that I pick up a new one in a contest. They're, they're typically the same ones over and over again. All right, how do I get back to the uh, slideshow? No, I can if I knew how. I just didn't see it here, so I, I wasn't able to click on it. And I don't multitask well, so I can't dive into how to, I can't explore how to do that while I'm talking to you. Okay. It, 160 is just an endorsement. It's not part of five band DXCC. It has to be 80, 20, you know, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. Carl? Oh, you can you can use any any station within your DXCC entity, but you have to use your call sign. You can't do it under W2MMD. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd I'd recommend you bring your laptop with you and log it right on the spot. Yes, you can use the clubhouse radios, antennas. The only thing you have to use is you have to use your call sign and you have to be in the U.S. or whatever country you did all your other DXCC contacts from. There used to be a so many hundred miles, but they got rid of that. So, yeah, absolutely. You can go to the clubhouse and get those last three or four that you need. No, no, no need. Just work them. Use your call and work them. As long as you're within the U.S., they count. Yeah. Yeah, they, they made it real simple. So the best part of DX Lab Suite is that it's free. See? And you really can't get a better program or one that's more powerful, even if you spend a lot of money. There are some ones that are easier to use. I think N3FAP has a general logging program that's really easy to use. I don't know that it's as powerful for tracking DX as DX Lab Suite. It is not, right? <laughs> so, so I highly recommend if you're going to seriously pursue this to start using DX Lab Suite as not only your primary logger, but also to keep track of everything and to some extent for your spot collection. And you can set that spot collector up to notify you by email and, and other means too. Let's go to the next one here. How are we doing on time? We're gonna get thrown out. I think we're good for another 10 minutes, right? Anybody falling asleep yet? We're not advancing. So what comes after logging and tracking? Oh, this is a good one. So in the old days, you had to send all these QSL cards and the DX stations wanted a green stamp. That's a dollar bill. Now they want anywhere from three to five green stamps. In other words, they're gonna charge you 
hey, it's for return postage, but they're going to charge you for that card. Well, you're going after 500 confirmations. You're going to need 500 QSLs. That money adds up quickly. So they invented something called the Bureau, where they just send the cards to a central collection point for your call area. And that's a lot cheaper, but it takes years. Um, so the best way, if you want to do this in a hurry, and that's what this is all about here, how to do it fast, sign up for Logbook of the World. You should do it anyway. Um, it's free. You don't have to be a member of ARRL, even though they, they operate it as a service, basically as a service to amateur radio, not to the members of the league. Um, but I think you should sign up. If you're going to use it, you should probably sign up for membership in the league just because they'll be maybe more appreciative. And um, if you want to redeem all of your 500 QSLs that are available, it's going to cost you 12 cents per QSL. So that's about 60 bucks to redeem all of your credits, which are confirmations. They're as good as a QSL card. And um, I, I just don't see any, you know, it, unless you like collecting cards, this is just the way to do it. You can get confirmed on the same day you work them. You can get confirmed if you set up your logger to report automatically. You can get it within the next few minutes. I personally don't upload to Logbook of the World except maybe four times a year, but that's just me. But And it's the reason is because I do a lot of contesting and I don't want all of that automatic uploading going on when I'm doing the contest because I already don't have enough data bandwidth to begin with you know so i'm already pushing the limits so four times a year i upload to logbook of the world i'll usually pick up two or three new ones if i'm lucky and um Yeah, it's pretty high percentage, though. Yeah. I mean, I I have a, a, a probably a 90%, maybe not that high, at least 80, though, um, QSL confirmation rate using Logbook of the World, which is pretty good. The basic DXCC? Yeah, you have to have a QSL card or an LOTW. Yeah, it's got to be one or the other. So the card has to be checked by a log checker. You know, that means 500 cards have to be checked. You could have a combination. I've, I've chosen to do it all on LOTW because I'm trying to expedite the process. Yeah. Right. Good to know. But sign up for LOTW anyway. If you're going to do five band DXCC, you want to sign up. Some people only do LOTW. Now, if I get a card from someone I'll, and they request a card, I'll send one out. But I don't QSL every single contact I make. It would cost a fortune. So that's what you got to You got to sign up for LOTW. Now, it's kind of a pain to sign up for LOTW, um, but it's worth the effort because you can go on there and check what you have confirmed. I probably have about, out of 234 worked, I probably have about 215 confirmed. That's pretty good, you know. Um, that's countries total across all bins. Um, so I highly recommend that. Um, I think I... I could show, I almost could show you LOTW, but in the interest of we're getting running late here, I'm going to not do that. Okay. Okay. In order to claim your credits, your QSL credits from LOTW, you have to pay 12 cents per credit. Like if you want to redeem it for an award, yeah, 
So, you know, if you're going to get your five band DXCC or even just a basic DXCC, every one of those QSL credits that you claim and use will cost you 12 cents, but that's 60 bucks for 500 of them. And that's a great deal because it could cost you two or 3000 if you direct mailed with return postage, you know, so. Yes. Only if you want the award. If you don't actually go for the award, it won't cost you anything. You just won't get the piece of paper. Would you what? Mm -hmm. Yep, get it checked. Yeah, and you'll you'll get credit for that if if it's been checked. Right. You could have a mix. You could have some of them in, in paper, some of them on LOTW. You can't use EQSL for a uh, league award. They don't recognize that. But uh, some people use it. All right, so this takes me to how I did it in five years. DX contest is the ultimate shortcut. Um, there's always 100 countries on or more at any time during the weekend of a DX contest. They're not exotic, they're not rare, but they're there and they have huge signals. And a lot of them have very good ears. And so you can get on there. And even if you're not a contester, just get on there and work the DX that you need. Uh, abide by the rules, give them the information that they ask for, and then upload your, your log um, after you're done. And you will hopefully get credit for most of them. And Back in uh, October when I did the, um, now remember I told you it took me five years to get 100 on 10 meters. Back in October during the CQ Worldwide phone contest on 10 meter single sideband, I worked 115 DXCC countries in one weekend because the band was on fire. See? So had I just waited, I wouldn't have had to work on it for five years. But yeah. So, okay. 80 meters. I had to, I had to do a special effort to get a hundred on 80. And what I did was I devoted an entire winter season, um, to working only 80 meter DX. I didn't go after DX. Now I did do my regular contest activity, but when I got on the air and looked at spots, I was only looking at 80 meters when I was looking for countries. During that particular year, it was about three or four years ago, I was only looking at 80. Every night, I would get on and check the spots. And you're not going to do it all on phone. It's just not that many countries all on phone. I was using CW, but you could use FT8. And I devoted uh, about a three-month period starting in late fall around November uh, till it started warming up you know, around March to getting a hundred. And I, I think I got up to about 124 from about 60. So I basically doubled the number of countries I had on 80 using a dipole. That's all I have. It was low. It was only like 35 feet up. So it was nothing special. I was using, yeah, I was using about five, 600 Watts and a good portion of them were on CW. Not all. Yeah. Using what? Uh, sometimes. Gray line was when the uh, sunset propagation, right? Right at sunset or sunrise. Hey, Tony. But, yes. Of any N4 NYY. Yeah. So I'm one of those people that are stuck at 97 confirmed on, on 80 meters, and I don't have an amp. I'm using 100 watts. Uh, and then on, on FT8, I'm using 50 to 70 watts. Uh, if you want to work FT, uh, if you want to get it, you're going to need, you're going to need to get into FT8 or CW, as you said. And from what I noticed, the best times are approximately about 3 or 4 p.m. until Europe goes to bed. And the weekends are better because they stay up later. Absolutely. Uh, I only have uh, a 35-foot OCF, you know, off-center fed dipole which is why I sent an email out the other day asking if the 80 meter dipole was up. Uh, I've been trying to get these last three countries for over a year. And I have the exact opposite of you. I had a hundred 
in the last cycle on 10 meters, I, I have like 100 and uh, well over 125 on 10 meters from the last cycle. So I don't even pay attention to 10 meters. And a lot of them were on five watt QRP, which still count us towards the FCC. Uh, and 80 meters has just been a nightmare for, for, for over a year now. I just can't get, and the ones that I could see that are, that I need don't hear me. Uh, if you're waiting for sideband, like you said, uh, forget it. You know, sideband is pretty much other than the contests and uh, rag chewing for DX sideband is pretty much dead. Everything's gone to CW or FTA or other digital modes like Ridley or whatever. Uh, but FTA is huge for, for, so you really want to pursue, uh, you know, five band DXCC, my guess is get into FTA because it'll make your life a hell of a lot easier uh, because sideband is going to be very difficult now, unless you know code. If you know code, then, then it's even better. Yeah, absolutely, Vinny. Everything you said is true, and especially with 80 meters, there's just not a lot of DX to be worked on phone, and there's actually stations that'll actively QRM the DX that's in the DX window on 80. So um, it's almost a don't bother situation. So use um, FT8, use CW, and the time of day that you said is very, very good observation. There's certain times of day that are much better. And unfortunately, when the high bands are good, like right now, 80 is not that great. 80 was better four years ago when 10 meters sucked. You know, when there was nothing going on in 10, the propagation on 80 was pretty darn good. It just has to do with where you are in the cycle. So I say work, work the band if you can, work the bands that are good now. Now you're down to the last few. You could, you could do that from the clubhouse on the uh, antenna that we have down there. And another suggestion for DX on 80 is a loaded vertical is a put up some kind of a vertical, you know, like a 43 foot vertical or something with a loading coil or matching network at the bottom. It'll work DX a lot better than a low dipole will. I, I know my low dipole was really not that good, but uh, verticals are pretty good. So uh, that's what I have to say about 80. Um, it's going to be tough, especially now. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Vertical's good uh, for DX for especially the long stuff on the lower frequencies. The lower you go in frequency, the better the vertical will work for DX. All right. So uh, I mentioned that a good contester, oh, this one, yeah, a good contester can work DXCC in one weekend. I think uh, Daryl AB2E did it on three bands during that last uh, big DX contest that we did. And he had 100, on, 100 countries on three different bands in one weekend. So uh, it is possible. If you're not working contests, you're making it take too long. You know, you can do it the hard way, but if you want to do it fast, get in the contest. They're all out there. You only, like I said, you don't need good ones. You only need a hundred different ones and upload on a regular basis to logbook of the world. I do it quarterly better, you know, monthly is better, but, uh, every time you do it, you'll see your totals go up. If you're doing, if you're getting a new one or two, every time the number will click a couple go up a little higher. Let's see if we can. Okay. So we're getting up on 9.30, close to 9.30 here, and we're supposed to be out of here. So I'm going to cut this short. The conclusion is don't wait till next year. If you want to do this, get started now. Propagation is getting better every day. Do it and have fun. So um, that's all I have for tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Tech Saturday is Saturday. Board of Directors meeting is next week. And uh, have a good evening, everybody. Our uh, ready contest is Saturday. Uh, Tony, what, was there another contest, John? Not this week, not this week Tony says. Well, there might be, but I don't know. Not, not something Tony knows about.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.